Marangaria, Nadu Yinjimara, Eora Mine, Gadigal Nurumbang. I want to pay my respects to the people of the Eora Nation and the land of the Gadigal people and extend respect as well to those who have served our country and continue to serve our country. Tonight, as we approach Anzac Day and remember the past, what do we owe the future? Should submarines come before a house, a job, the ability to put food on the table? On the panel, proud Wiradjuri woman, lawyer and Indigenous rights campaigner, Taylor Gray, who is completing a PhD in Native Title Law. <laughs> Assistant Minister for Trade and Manufacturing, Tim Ayres, who recently travelled to China for trade talks with business leaders. <laughs> Manager of Opposition Business and Shadow Minister for Government Services and the Digital Economy, Paul Fletcher. The first ever Commissioner for Future Generations in Wales, Sophie Howe, who's in Australia to share what she learned in the role. And Army veteran and CEO of the Space Industry Association of Australia, James Brown. Welcome them all. Where are young people in our vision of the future? Thank you again for that welcome. And remember, you can live stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag, so please get involved. Plenty to get to tonight, including what a war in space might look like and will the Australian wine industry ever be the same after those sanctions from China? To get us started tonight, here's a question from Anhar Kareem. 16 and 17-year-olds in Australia can work, they can pay taxes, they can join the military, make important medical decisions and drive. Yet politicians continue to ignore us when it comes to making critical decisions about our lives and our futures. My question to the panel is, when will Australia lower the voting age to 16 and stop denying young people the right to vote? Thank you, Anna. Sophie, is that a good idea to you as someone who's... Uh, worked in a similar area in Wales? Well, um, the young lady's absolutely right in terms of um, uh, being able to go to war, um, being able to work, to drive, and, and on all of these things, but um, absolutely should not be allowed um, a democratic uh, voice. And that can't, be, uh, that can't be right. In Wales, actually, we have vo uh, lowered the voting mm. age to 16. We're also the first country in the world to put in place legal protections for the interests of future generations. And I think that that is critically important because what we're seeing is that the decisions that our politicians are taking today and... Um, um, in Australia, the average age of a politician is about 52. Um, so those people who are taking decisions today, and I, you know, I pay my respect to our political colleagues on the on the panel here, um, but they're not digital natives. Um, they won't be experiencing climate anxiety in the same way as our young people. Mm. They won't be grappling with issues of identity and polarisation and how do you navigate um, misinformation and disinformation and so on. And so actually our younger people have this breadth of knowledge and wisdom which perhaps our current leaders don't have. And that's why it's not only put important to lower the voting age, I believe, to give our young people a voice, but also to have uh, legal requirements on our government not just here in Australia, but across the world, and there are plans um, for a declaration for future generations mm. at a United Nations level, um, to make sure that our politicians today are meeting today's needs, meeting the needs of current uh, generations without compromising the needs of future generations. Let me just... <laughs> let me just ask you about that role. Yours as a, a commissioner for future mm -hmm. generations was a world first, mm -hmm. others are following. But how did that come about? What was it in Wales that identified the need for that position? Well, there was a frustration in Wales that we used terms willy-nilly like sustainable development, like we want to protect the interests of our children. But actually, if you tracked back the decisions that were actually being taken, that wasn't um, really what was happening at all. So if we, you know, take all of the evidence around the importance of investing in the first thousand days of life, so from pregnancy to age two, mm. the most critical period, um, and yet we're not putting our investment in those areas. If 
if we look at issues around how well our education system is equipping our young people not just to go into another job, and of course those jobs in the future will be fundamentally mm. different to the ones and we have today. And they'll have many different jobs as well. Absolutely. 65% of children entering uh, primary school today are likely to go on to do jobs that don't even exist yet. But actually the point of our education system is also to deliver um, or equip our young people to have a life well lived as well as um, a good working life. And so in Wales we felt um, that we weren't really um, doing that and our government actually took a brave decision, it is a really brave decision, to put new duties, legal duties, on themselves, the appointment of an independent commissioner who's going to call them out, and I did call them out regularly when they weren't acting in the interests of future generations and applying our law, but to say actually it's not our uh, planet to use, abuse and trash, um, it's our planet to protect, it's our duty as politicians to leave the world better than we found it for our future generations. Taylor, is there a need for something similar in Australia? And back to that question, do you believe that 16-year-olds should have the vote? Yes, absolutely. And our young people, the, you, the younger generation, you guys are just so inspiring. I honestly, I put my hands down to you. Mm. When, you know, we have to start involving young people. Um, and in particular, like First Nations communities then, like mm -hmm. we are dying 10 years on average younger mm -hmm. than every other Australian. There is urgency where we need to vote as well. We must have a say. And imagine if we did have a future generations commissioner role like here in Australia, we are so behind. We need to start involving our youth and our young people because they have all the answers. And her. <laughs> You're 15, is that right? So. You would be voting next year um, if indeed that were the case in Australia. Why do you believe you should have the vote? Yeah, so I'm grateful enough to be here today as part of the Make It 16 campaign. And so through that campaign and lots of other committees, I've met so many incredible young people. I think it's really great that a lot of the panellists have like acknowledge the importance of young people and the work that they're doing. But in those spaces, I've seen so many really incredible young people who are doing things like working and paying tax, but also doing things like advocating. And so I think they are contributing so much to our society. As a young person myself, I'm really passionate about a range of issues. And I think young people in particular tend to be passionate about things like climate justice, economic and mm -hmm. racial justice. And I think those are things we really want politicians to actually be able to address. Mm -hmm. Paul Fletcher. Do you believe do you believe that politicians speak to the issues that Anahar has talked about and connect with that generation? Well, I certainly believe that um, young people have uh, extraordinary insights. One of the pri unexpected privileges of being a Member of Parliament is that you get to spend a lot of time with young people, uh, local students, uh, hearing from them on, on many issues. And I'm very confident, actually, about the future of our nation because of the fact that today's young people grow up steeped in information. They, they're used to living in a world where you can access information of all kinds uh, almost instantly and you can get deeper and deeper into, into an issue. And I'm always amazed by how much young people know about particular issues. I hasten to add, I'm also often amazed by how much older people in my electorate are using technology as well. They, so, they already have the vote. Should someone like Anna have the vote at 16? Uh, well, I think Anna's experience is going to be very, very valuable. And the great thing about being 16 is that you know that very soon you will be 18. Uh, you've always got to... So, uh, so should they have to you, wait? You've always got to pick a dividing line somewhere. Uh, and I think the experience that young people have when they're 16 and 17 will equip them well when they're able to vote at age 18. I think that might be a no, Anna. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Tim. Yeah. 16. Too young? It sounded, it sounded like a no to me. I, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I look at what young people are doing now in terms of uh, advocacy. You know, I watched what the Students for Climate Action, the student strikes around climate, did to elevate those issues in pe people's thinking. And, um, you know, I am, I'm interested in any proposition that strengthens our democracy. Um, so does that mean a, giving 16-year-olds well, a vote? Well, certainly in terms of where uh, Labor is at and where the government is at on these issues at the moment, the priority in terms of electoral reform now is donations reform, transparency issues. I think There's you might be hearing another no, Anna. <laughs> but, um, but I have an open mind about these questions and it's one of the things that I think that we ought, really ought to grapple with, the idea that we can engage more young people in a sort of programmatic and effective way with our democracy when democracy is under assault all around the world, like mm. these are ideas that we should have an open mind about. It's also the topic of our online poll tonight. We're asking you, should the voting age in Australia be lowered from 18 
to 16. You can cast your votes on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. We'll check back in with that a bit later and bring you those results. We're going to hear now from David Gunter. Hi, Stan. Hi, David. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, my question, um, if whenever you see a returned soldier um, speak about war, mostly, if not always, they look down the camera and tell this nation that we should do everything in our power not to go to war. Do you think currently that there is enough sincerity or effort around global peacekeeping? James Thank Brown. Yeah, look, and, and that's you're right to identify that, David. The, um, I think the message you'll hear from most people who've seen war or smelt war is that you want to be as far away from it as possible. And war is a cancer that the Department of Defence and, and a lot of people around Australia and our national security apparatus try to keep from our door as best they can. I, I think what we've seen today in the Defence Strategic Review uh, will move us away from global peacekeeping. The two Indeed risks... Of spending that... more money on, on military and preparing for <coughs> a war and it's indeed the... trying to play catch-up. The, the language is really unequivocal. What are we preparing for? We're preparing for the chance that China might go to war against the US and its allies and the impact that, that might have on our economic connection to the world and our freedom and our values. Mm. Um, the line that really jumped out at me in that report today was, um, we believe the risk of nuclear escalation in our region is real. So what that report tells us is this is not a 10-year away problem, this is not a five-year away problem, this is a three-year away problem today, here and now um, that we've got to be thinking about. So I think, I think Australia is going to be very focused and it's going to have to be very focused on where we can have influence in our near region and the things that we have to do to keep our way of life free from, from interference and coercion. Tim, is the defence review and admission that we are playing catch-up it talks about our military at the moment is not prepared for the wars we may have to fight. It's still operating on a bygone era. How do we do that in a world where China is rapidly building its military capacity? Well, it, it's certainly true that the report draws a pretty stark picture uh, in terms of regional security. Uh, and it paints uh, a very stark picture of what is required from the government to ensure uh, that we've got a defence force that is fit for purpose, uh, that, is, that is able to meet uh, the challenge of the changing regional security environment. Now, I, I agree with the question up there. I've never spoken to a veteran or a soldier who thinks anything other than that uh, war is a terrible thing that must be avoided at all costs. So the government's approach to these set of questions is, yes, there is a requirement for marked change in terms of our defence settings. But it's also a government that's committed to doing all of the other things that are required to happen to ensure that we've got a region that is safe and secure. How that real is the threat? Well, the, the threat has been painted in pretty stark terms in the review. Uh, and, and that means we've got to deal with defence policy. Uh, we've got to engage in the region in the way that you've seen the government engage in a more thorough and careful and consistent way across the region. We've got to engage our domestic policy settings as well. This is all about deploying Australian statecraft to make sure that we do everything that we can to build the kind of region mm. uh, that we need to see for our kids and grandkids. We know we're talking about China um, and China has been identified as a threat because of its military build-up and threatening noises toward Taiwan and the speculation now of potential conflict with China. China says that threat is being hyped. Are we hyping the threat? Well, I think what we're seeing in the region, uh, the first point to make is we're, what we're seeing in the region is a changing set of circumstances and, and a focus on China is by no means the only focus that underscores the defence review. The second thing is that we do see the biggest military build-up in the region, uh, in, in the region's history really since the Second World War, uh, without the kind of reassurance and transparency about strategic intent that we would expect to see. And, and, and that, is, that is driving decision making, uh, that is driving policy makers. Uh, yes, as I, as I said before, in terms of our defence settings and the kind of capabilities that we need to have to make sure that we've got the kind of deterrent capability that Australia needs, but also across all of the other areas of statecraft that go to building a more resilient 
uh, more capable Australia and a stronger mesh of relationships across the region. Paul Fletcher, this of course was underway in the previous government which had increased military spending and of course had done the submarine deal with AUKUS which we'll come to. But just to go back to David's question, is there an unhealthy focus on war and preparing for war and not enough focus on peace? Well, they're really uh, two sides of the same coin in the sense that what we all want is a stable, secure Indo-Pacific and what uh, Australia wants to do is to be a responsible contributor to stability and security. Uh, what you need is uh, a capacity to uh, defend the nation and this review talks about the fact that threats can occur quite, the coercion can be imposed quite separate from invasion. And so we certainly did, when in government, uh, fund a very substantial increase. Uh, we'd seen uh, defence spending uh, in the last years of the Rudd Gillard government uh, drop to 1.56%, the lowest level since 1938, 1.56% of GDP. Uh, we've increased that to 2%. Uh, that, amongst other things, was very important in having the credibility with the US and the UK to be able to enter into the AUKUS arrangement, which will allow Australia to operate uh, nuclear-powered submarines. And, of course, the present government has continued that direction, but that increase in funding was very important in demonstrating our capability and commitment. Yeah. It's all about uh, being able to contribute to a secure, stable Indo-Pacific. Uh, and, of course, you need to plan, but the planning is with a view to maintaining peace. Uh, the question, of course, um, came from David talking about the impact of war, isn't it, David, and soldiers who reflect on the impact mm. of war. And, Taylor, as we think about Anzac Day, we know that there is still not a commemoration in the War Memorial that recognises the frontier wars mm. and the wars that First Nations people fought on this land against people invading First Nations land. How do you reflect on this and the talk of war with the legacy of conflict in our own country? Yeah, it's it's problematic, and but firstly, like I, I peacekeeping is something I value. This society talks a lot about peacekeeping, um, but nobody wants to engage in alternative dispute resolution, um, and <laughs> and I res and I can hear the sincerity in the gentleman's voice asking this question, and you know, war is a is a terrible thing. And when we look at the frontier wars, like, trust me, our people know. Our people know because we are still going unrecognised in this country of our frontier wars. You know, the, the Wiradjuri wars, the Bathurst wars. Our people fought for this country as well. And we, you know, we went overseas. We come back. There were no land packages for us. You know, we are not a broken nation, but we are an unhealed one. Mm. And it's my people... <laughs> Of that. Mm. What, how does that play out in the lives of people, the memories of war and conflict? How does that impact the lives of people today? It doesn't First stop, Nations people. It doesn't stop just as at one generation. You know, it flows on and on and on. Intergenerational trauma is a real thing and mm. it's alive and well. We're going to keep this discussion going now. We have a question from Martin Peoples. Martin. Thanks, Stan. Uh, this year we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War and Australian involvement. As a Vietnam veteran suffering from PTSD following the seeing a mate killed in action, what more can federal governments do to support our veterans and cut the red tape when dealing with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Well, well, thank you very much for that question. And, um, you know, I just reflect maybe first, uh, Stan, on, you know, my experience of Anzac Day as a boy growing up in country New South Wales was that those issues that you raise uh, and, David, from your question earlier on, you know, the, the impact is, was utterly clear in the 1980s growing up as a kid mm. on... And, and we were close, within touching distance, of men and women who'd served in Vietnam and the Korean War, the Second World War, and there were still 
old men from mm. the First World War. And as you say, the intergenerational trauma mm. that war creates in families is just so, just so profound. And in the bush, you get to see that, you know, really, really close up. I was engaged in Senate estimates asking questions, critical questions of the last government and their approach in terms of veterans' I, I affairs. I think, though, Tim, so if it's I can right get to the to point, say, the, the question is, what are you doing yeah, now? Yeah, that's right. So, so there's a responsibility, isn't there, to say, what is it that we are doing now? Well, what, what Matt Keogh, uh, who's the Minister for Veterans Affairs, has been doing is really three things. Number one, bringing on staff to make sure that we get rid of the backlog. Uh, number two... Uh, making sure that we're delivering reforms and working with the veterans community on reforms to make the act simpler so that veterans can get through. Uh, and finally, implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission. Uh, it's a straightforward reform agenda. There is much more work to do. I can tell you that veterans and their families are always making representation to the government and, and we are listening really carefully. Does that answer your concerns? One of the questions I did have... Uh... Tim, uh, when I thank you for the answer, but one of the questions I've had to deal with is when you deal with staff of Veterans Affairs, no matter what government's in, which you respect, Paul, um, a lot of the people you deal with in Veterans Affairs are, if I can use the term, public servants or bureaucrats, right? Now, when I made a claim to Veterans Affairs, I spoke to a young lady and she sounded like she was 20, with due respect to her. And I said to her about the Vietnam War and she said, quote, unquote, uh, I've read a bit about that. And I said, now, because I'm in, I have PTSD, like I said, I get some great support from open arms, right? Now, the difference is... The people in open arms, a lot of them are ex-defence people and they are empathetic <coughs> to what my needs are. I spoke to a friend of mine at a, my local RSL today and I said, how are you going with your claim? And he said, I've given up. Mm. He said, stand, stand on my... the paperwork is so onerous mm. and the interrogation is so onerous. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, so, well, I'm sorry the, to hear the that first, you've had the first, that experience. The first thing the Department of Veterans Affairs asks you to do is to prove you're the worst version of yourself possible. Yeah, Tell us how sick you are, <laughs> right? And you, you're explaining it to someone who often doesn't know what it's like to be in the military. And, you know, we have come so far in the last five years to change that system. And two of the big things that have been done in the last five years, both I've, I've been involved in. Last year, a small thing that cost $10 million we put a question on the census to ask, have you served in the Australian Defence Force? Yeah. And the results of that had just started coming back. So now for the first time, we actually know there are 600,000 veterans in Australia. We know where they live. We know what kind of long-term illnesses they're dealing with. We know what kind of services they need. That is a huge step. And I think yeah. the second thing we've done is we, we've changed the culture in veterans affairs. I chair a charity called Invictus Australia, which. Mm sends athletes to the Invictus Games mm. to compete with their families, which runs grassroots sports programs across the country. Mm. It's about a positive message, connecting people with sport, not asking people to fill out, you know, hundreds of pages of paperwork and tell us mm. how sick you are, but actually <coughs> have a positive message, bring people together. So we've, we've changed that culture in the last five years. We've still got a long way to go. Um, and... You know, I see, I see people on both sides of politics taking the issue of veterans seriously. The Royal Commission has done more than anything else to shed light on that. And, you know, when I first started talking to Veterans Affairs Ministers when I was President of the RSL about the need for that, people said, no, we don't need that. But, well, but, now we've just done an extra two years on that Royal Commission. But, James, we're, we're hearing... We're still hearing um, from people like Martin who are still having to deal with the traumatic impact. And I'm sorry to hear that. Martin, that that continues to be a part of your life. And thank you again for the service you gave this country. Um, <laughs> for Paul Fletcher, this is, this is a pox on both your houses, isn't it? This is someone saying, I served the country, my mates served the country, and they're giving up. What does that tell us about how we're failing these people? Well, I think when you have problems, what you have to do is... Uh, acknowledge that fact and investigate that, which was why 
uh, we did um, kick off the Royal Commission uh, into particularly the question of um, uh, veteran suicides and uh, we established a commissioner to have an ongoing role there. Um, the, the, the service that people give uh, exposes them uh, to things that are obviously very, very traumatising and that has uh, lifelong impacts. Uh, that is why, of course, there is a completely separate structure in terms of the Department of Veterans Affairs, quite separate from uh, mm -hmm. the other arrangements we have, for example, through the Department of Social Services, and for very, very good reasons. Uh, but is there more work to do? Uh, I think there is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, Stan, that the, the, uh, one of the points that's really important here, you know, I mean, James's contribution in this area in the community has been really strong. The, the book that you wrote, I think, eight or nine years ago, Anzac's Long Shadow, says, and I think it's right, that there is a chasm between the, the rhetoric around Anzac Day uh, mm. and the way that as a government and as a community and as the private sector, we support our veterans. And your experience isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the challenge we've had to deal with as a government is that the Department of Veterans Affairs under the last government, 50% of the staff yeah, I, were outsourced. I, yes, but I, 50%. I, I think the question now uh, is where, and, we, where and, we go forward, and, isn't and, it? And, and what do we have to do? We have to rebuild that department and its capability. We've got to make sure that every veteran who rings up has somebody who empathises with them and helps them sort through the problems and that they don't have to do what James has described. Thank you. This is indicative of a failure within our systems more broadly. And James is absolutely right. Um, we can... You can certainly now identify where veterans are, what sort of health conditions they've got. We have known for a very long time that veterans are far more likely to be in need of mental health services. Um, they are sadly more likely um, perhaps to have um, drug or alcohol issues. For the children of veterans, um, those children are often growing up in households where um, they are experiencing childhood adversities as a result of those mental health issues, um, as a result of their parents being absent and a whole range of, of other things. We know, for example, that rates of domestic abuse um, and so on are high. We know all of those things um, and yet we fail to intervene early. Now, I can't profess to know the ins and outs, certainly not um, of the Veteran Affairs um, Department here in Australia, but I can say that across the globe, um, systematically, we fail to intervene early, mm. we fail to prevent problems that we know about, and we fail to take a long-term approach to dealing with these things. And I think that's why these issues are occurring right. in veteran services, in children's services, and throughout. We're, we're going to have to move on, Martin, but thank you for your question. I hope tomorrow is a good day for you. I see you have your medals with you tonight, and I hope tomorrow that you can spend that day with people who serve with you, and I hope it's a good day for you. Thank you. <laughs> If this discussion is raising any difficulties for you or anyone you know, the numbers for Lifeline and Open Arms are there on your screen. If you're just joining us, you're watching Q&A Live with Taylor Gray, Tim Ayres, Paul Fletcher, Sophie Howe and James Brown. Next, we'll hear from James Woodburn. Hi, Stan. Thanks for that. Uh, my question is to you, James Brown, is why should we be worried about a war in space and what might it look like? Well, look, it's been a big week in space. Before we start worrying about space wars, we saw the Starship X uh, from SpaceX launch uh, and have, what was it, a rapid unscheduled disassembly or whatever they call it. Is that it? what but they call it? That, that, is, that, that is like watching the first flight of the Wright brothers or the first vial of penicillin roll out of the lab, right? It's that because it will change item. things that significantly? It will change the world. It will get the cost down to $200 a kilogram to get stuff into space, and that will change the world. Does it, it. does it also take us closer to conflict in space? I mean, are we already there? It, it raises stakes. Are we, we already there? Because we, we know that it's contested space. We, look, it's, it's already happening. I mean, the, the military significance of space is so dominant. If you're talking about any kind of conflict, whether it's Ukraine and Russia or China and the US or North Korea and South Korea, space is critical. We, and we, we saw this week in Australia, the GPS signal went down, half the tractors and combine harvesters in the country stopped mm -hmm. working, mm -hmm. uh, couldn't get the winter planting in, right? Mm. Serious, serious dependence on space for everyday life. So, of course, militaries are taking an interest in that. There's a lot of activity happening in space. Um, there are launches that go up and we just don't know what they're doing. Uh, there are things that go up from these launches that sit in space, don't move for a couple of months and then start going around and going up against other people's satellites. We've had 
Chinese satellites that have come up next to Australian satellites. So they're, they're, they're chasing each other in yeah. space, aren't they? Yeah, and we it's... know the United States, China and Russia have blown up satellites as a, as a, a, a warning as to what is capable. Could you talk about something that you know, I've, I've heard about, and that is the idea of a space Pearl Harbor? And we hear this with China, that China has the capacity to launch a surprise attack in space and what impact that would have if it did indeed take out those military satellites. Look, I mean, everything that happens in the military relies on space. Everything from buying food to sending missiles to intelligence um, to tracking ships, it's all dependent on space at the moment. Um, Australia owns very few satellites that can do those things. Most of it we depend on the US for, um, even weather. You can't go to war without knowing what the weather is. Uh, Australia doesn't own a single weather satellite. We get it all for free from the Japanese. So it's built into some militaries' planning and capabilities, and we saw that in some of those documents that were leaked out of the US this week. The US is very concerned that China is building a capacity to take down satellites. It's part of their battle planning. Uh, and the consequences for everyday economic activity, for our monitoring of climate change, let alone security, um, would be very significant if there was any sort of conflict in space. Stan, I think it's just, yeah. I think it's just worth stopping to reflect for a second. The, the, one of the reasons that there's more focus on military potential in space is because of the amount of economic activity now happening in space. In other words, uh, there have always been navies that follow uh, or focused on shipping lanes because there's ec economic activity, you have navies to defend, navies mm. to attack. Uh, if you look at the amount of economic activity that's happening in space, communication satellites, we've always had the geostationary satellites. Innovation, we 30, see the 36,000 Ks up, but now we've got the low earth orbiting satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of people in rural Australia now taking the Starlink uh, service uh, and enjoying the speeds mm. that that provides. And certainly under the Morrison government, we had a big focus on the economic opportunities of space. We established the Australian Space Agency in 2018. There are companies like uh, Fleet Space Technologies based in Adelaide doing amazing work using low earth orbiting satellites to connect to sensor devices uh, for mining. So you can use these sensors connected to low earth orbiting satellites to gather data and identify whether um, a particular piece of land is, is prospective in terms of ore. Or another Australian company, Miriota, also, mm -hmm. also doing low earth orbiting satellites for agriculture. Uh, James is right to say we rely upon satellites for GPS, for weather data and other things. We certainly had a plan to get Australian satellites up in space and there are private sector businesses with satellites. Uh, unfortunately, the present government seems to have less of a focus on the opportunities uh, and we have seen, for example, uh, they've not included space in the um, in the National Reconstruction Framework, so I think that's uh, uh, fun, so I think that's a, a bit of a missed opportunity. Uh, but it is important. This is an exciting area of, of growth, and Australia has some real assets. I'll get Tim to quickly respond yeah, to look, that. Look, I think it's important not to heckle Paul while he's making the hyper-partisan sort of points, right? The, 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 the government's... Because he's your chance to make a hyper-partisan point. The government's plan, a $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund, to rebuild Australian manufacturing capability, and space is part of that story. It's an it's enabling not, it's not capability. One of your priority areas. The only person who's saying that space isn't part of the story is this bloke. We, this is this is the biggest peacetime reindustrialisation package. Anthony Albanese saying we have to rebuild manufacturing in Australia. Now you can't tell me that we can face the new challenges of the region uh, with our manufacturing capability down to less than 7% of GDP. Stone cold last in the OECD under this government uh, in terms of manufacturing self-sufficiency, continuing to decline, and that has an impact on our country towns and our outer suburbs. We're going to rebuild manufacturing in this country. Uh, the Liberals and Nationals voted against the package. Um, you know, Joe Biden in the United States, in that polarised environment, able to get Republicans and Democrats to vote for the biggest industry policy package in American history, yeah. and these guys couldn't bring themselves I, to vote for it in Australia. I want to... Everybody... I want to bring it... I want to bring it back to James's question. And, Taylor, when you hear James's question and you hear the other James's response to that, and the real possibility, putting aside the economic benefits, and of course we know there are benefits from innovation, we've already seen the prospect of tourism and more travel into space and the, 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 the economic benefits that will flow from that. When you hear conflict in, sp in space, and reflecting on what you said earlier about the intergenerational impact of war and conflict, 
How does it make you feel when we are now looking at weaponising space? Worried. Mm. We don't want to go to war again. I know my generation, we don't want to go to war. Mm. We, we can hear the sincerity in the gentleman's, you know, comments and the gentleman up top. Like, we don't want to do that. Where is the peacekeeping in this? Why, why are we... And I'm not naive. I, I understand we, we need defence. But at what cost? Mm -hmm. mm. Sophie. Are we focusing on the, the right things here? I mean, I, I agree that there are the potential um, economic uh, benefits from, from space, but perhaps I could take you to a place where um, perhaps you've not been taken to on Q&A before, which is to a Disney movie. Um, <laughs> it's one called WALL-E. Does anyone know that, um, that movie? Um, so what happens in WALL-E is that um, we have trashed Earth. Planet Earth has been trash trashed so much that all that's left there are robots, including the robot Wally, clearing up the mess from Earth. Humans are up living on space stations, um, and actually their health has become so poor they can no longer walk, and they're scooting around on on these kind of uh, hoverboards and so on. Now that may sound sort of um, amusing, but actually, you know, that is a potentially dystopian future mm. that we could be heading for. I know from, you know, I'm Future Generations Commissioner, part of my job is engaging with lots of futurists and people who are experts in looking at potential trends and scenarios. And there are already people who are developing space stations, uh, you know, looking at the development of space stations for humans to live on. There are space architects working out what that could be. And the reasons why they're doing that is because there's a very real chance that we will not have a planet Earth to live on. So when we talk about seizing the economic opportunities around space, Actually, I think the thing that we need to do first is to seize the challenge of climate change, seize some of the opportunities. That, um, and I, I agree with the point on Biden's investment, the biggest infrastructure investment uh, programmes, particularly focused around this shift and transition to a low-carbon economy. That is what we need to be mm. focusing on. That is the biggest threat to us as humanity. Climate change really is a lie. We should be calling it... Um, you know, wiping us out of existence. That's what we should be calling it. It's not climate change. It's an existential threat to our planet. And that's what we need to be focusing on before we get to space. Well done. I want to go to our... Um, thank you for the question. I want to go to our next question now. It's a video from Anaru August. I asked this question as a proud Tuhoi Māori man from Aotearoa, New Zealand, living on Bunwarang country in Nā, Melbourne, for the past 10 years. With Anthony Albanese's announcement about a new path for Kiwis to become Australians, and with the potential for hundreds of thousands of new voters being sworn in as Australian Kiwis from July 1, does this mean the Indigenous voice has just landed a massive new voting block for yes? Yes! Yeah. question, Taylor. The short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If I, could, if I could tell the future, I'd love to give you an answer, but the reality is I can't. Um, and when we look at the voice, like, you know, people often ask me, is it a yes or is it a no from you, Taylor? And again, at this point, I don't know because I don't think I could put it down to a yes or no vote. Mm. Um, some of my research, you know, I look at what other foreign jurisdictions are doing, like in, Canada. In New Zealand as well. And in New Zealand. And we, and we see that they, you know, they, they have the um, Treaty of Waitangi Tribunal that deals with the breaches of treaty. Um, and then you look at Canada that, who had an enshrined, essentially an enshrined voice in their constitution. Um, but the thing is, all those Indigenous people had land to go back to regardless of the constitutional amendments, regardless of the treaty breaches. There were, they, you know, those Indigenous people had access to a lodial title, freehold title, treaty lands. If we don't get this right, we have no land to go back to. Yeah! This land is unceded. Yeah! Does that mean, would you be hopeful that a voice would lead to that sort of outcome? Or do you believe that treaty should come before the voice? And what should a treaty look like in that case? It's tricky to say, mm. but I think, you know, and the way, the way people are going to vote is they should lean on their mentors. They should lean on, you know, if you, if you have a First Nations person in your community that you're close to, vote in a way that's going to help them 
and uplift them. And you're not sure yet which way that would be, whether it is yes or a no. Yeah, that's right. I'm still contemplating, I'm still deliberating. I'm not for or I'm not, and I'm not against, and you know what, that's okay for now. Mm. We want to stay on this issue. You can, you can clap. <laughs> we want to stay on this issue. We have a video question from Matthew Robson. Hi, panel. Uh, my question is for Paul Fletcher. Paul, do you support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples being recognised in the Constitution in the manner that they have requested through a voice to Parliament? Will you call on Australians to vote yes to this proposal? Or are you going to join your colleague Simon Birmingham on the fence by sticking to the front bench no position and in doing so, keeping your portfolio job? Thanks. Yes. Uh, well, thank you, Matthew, for the question. Um, the Liberal Party <laughs> supports constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. We've, we've made that very plain. And indeed, it was a process that was kicked off as far, far back as... Uh, 2015, uh, jointly by Tony Abbott, then Liberal Prime Minister and Bill Shorten, then uh, Labor Leader of the Opposition. So we are uh, committed to constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. Um, and but it's not the, the voice as it is put forward. As I understand, you spoke against the opposition to the voice in Shadow Cabinet. Is that the case? I will stand. I've never been in the habit of commenting on cabinet discussions or shadow cabinet discussions, and I'm not going to change that practice But uh, others, others in, on your side of politics have come out and said that they support it. Would you be supporting a yes vote for the voice proposal? Stan, what I support is constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. That's what the Liberal Party supports. I support local and regional bodies uh, so that uh, people in... Uh, remote Indigenous communities, for example, who can often justifiably feel a very long way away from decisions that affect them, have the opportunity to have input into policy matters that affect them, whether they be federal government uh, decisions or state government decisions concerning education and health and so on. And of course, what I also support and what our position will be is that we will vote yes for the legislation to go through the parliament, which will then allow a referendum to occur so that every Australian who's on the electoral roll will have the chance to make their decision yes or no. Mm -hmm. As I get around and speak to people in my electorate, it's clear that uh, there is uh, a significant appetite uh, for constitutional recognition. There's a very significant appetite to be supportive uh, of the special place of Indigenous Australians. But there are also concerns that many have expressed to me about the specific form of the wording. Uh, so again, I repeat, the Liberal Party's position is we support constitutional recognition. And as Peter Dutton has said, uh, he's ready to start discussions with the Prime Minister about what that wording might be. So you're voting yes then? Uh, the Liberal Party's position is <laughs> cons yes con me. constitutional <laughs> recognition of Indigenous Australians. That, that's the position T that we Tim start. Ayres, um, without bipartisanship, we know history tells us that it is much more difficult for a referendum to succeed. Taylor is sitting next to you and Taylor has said that as far as she's concerned, she's not sure yet which way she's going to vote and there are divisions, of course, as there are in any community amongst First Nations communities. Is it getting harder? Oh, the... the um the referendum is, is always going to be a challenge. It's always going to be uh, a job to do, uh, explaining to Australians, answering the questions, listening... You know, not all, not all questions about the referendum are bad faith questions. Uh, and we've got, you know, five or six months to go, Taylor, and I hope, I hope, uh, I hope that, that, uh, that you and many other people accept that, uh, that the Uluru Statement provides for voice, truth-telling and treaty, and that this first step uh, that the government has committed to all of the Uluru Statement in full, uh, and that the first step is, of course, uh, the, the voice to Parliament. But we've got a lot of work to do, uh, listening and talking to people. The problem for Peter Dutton and David Littleproud... I mean, David Littleproud, the leader of the Nationals, committed the Nationals to a no position before they'd seen the question. <laughs> right, before they'd seen the question. The, the, the sort of extreme right-wing takeover of the uh, Liberals in Canberra so that moderate voices are just squeezed out uh, means that, uh, that Peter Dutton's campaign to, wreck, to, you know, to try and wreck the, con the, the, the prospects of constitutional reform... What was that kind well, of that talk, well, talking well, points? Well, decent, decent Liberals around the country are walking away from that position. 
Julie and Lisa walked away from that position. Uh, liberals, liberals who are sort of genuine conservatives, genuine, uh, genuine about these issues, have walked away, and I think we'll see more and more of that oh, over coming months. Stan, can, can I just yeah. make a point here? Um, the, the 1967. Uh, referendum was a very important moment in our country. And as you know, we had almost 91% voting. The yet. most successful referendum. Uh, indeed. And that occurred because there was bipartisan support. Now, I spoke about the process before. Uh, the 2015 uh, process was kicked off and indeed uh, legislation passed in 2013 with both parties supporting it to uh, commence a process towards constitutional recognition. So that recognition of bipartisanship and its importance has been really key all the way through. But unfortunately, we've got gone off in a different direction just since the election. What, what I would call on the Prime Minister to do is to uh, respond to Peter Dutton's invitation to sit down and negotiate, because if we can get that bipartisanship, yeah, James, that would be so important. James. I, I think it's unfair for Tim to, to suggest that opposition to The Voice is some sort of fringe of the Liberal Party. So I, I'm a member of the Liberal Party. Um, to, to, be, to be fully transparent, I've also nominated to be a candidate for the casual vacancy for Senator Jim Boland's position. So you, you, you are now putting your hat in the ring for that? You would yeah, like and, that and, and you cannot, you know, under the party's rules, you can't talk about that other than to say, as I've been... So do you fall silent for the rest of the program now? Is <laughs> yeah, what you're right. telling us? Um, but, 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 you but, know, but, but, I, I am someone who I think is fair-minded, who wants to see reconciliation, but will be voting no on this referendum. And um, the reason for that... Well, I, I, I don't... I, and, and I disagree with Matthew Robson's premise that this is not something... You know, my, my concern is that the potential risks of a yes on this referendum outweigh the benefits. And for me, true reconciliation in Australia has to be a coming together of Indigenous Australia and non-Indigenous Australia. So it's not enough to say this has been put up by Indigenous Australia and therefore it shouldn't be considered as I, to its impact. I, I want to come back to Taylor on this, but I'll, you've just broken the news that you are putting your hand up for this, uh, this Senate vacancy. Um, how confident are you of getting that? I, I look, it'd be an honour to replace Jim Mullen. He was a friend and a mentor, but, but I can't sort of go into the horse race or anything like that. But, um, you know, I think th this, this question of the voice, it is a question on which Australia is divided. It is a tough question. And my concern is I don't want to hear one side of the debate completely ignored or viewed as an illegitimate position. I think there are a number of people who are weighing this question, as others on the panel are, who don't want to go into a polling booth and be told that they're a racist if they oppose this referendum. While we're talking about political ambitions, and I do want to bring Taylor in here, there's been speculation, of course, about your own political ambitions in this Paul Fletcher. Indeed, it was speculated recently that you may even be trying to get the numbers to consider a challenge for leadership yourself. Is that something that you're, you're considering? No. No? No. Absolutely not under no. any circumstances? No. OK. <laughs> we have a very good leader and he has my full support. <laughs> Ta no, 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 that's... Ta Taylor, uh, just reflecting on the conversation we've heard tonight and reflecting on your own views as someone who has not yet landed on which way they would vote, how do you see this referendum debate shaping up? Do you believe we're hearing the voices? Do you believe that communities are engaged and getting the information that they need? What is this telling us about us? I think the more people whose views I don't align with say no, the more I'm inclined to say yes. Yeah! <laughs> I think there are a lot of questions, there are a lot of concerns, you know. It, there's, there's so many balls in the air, like, people are wanting to know more about where they stand in the community. There's questions, there's opposing opinions, there's First Nation voices in the community that haven't been heard yet. Their concerns haven't been addressed. You know, what, you know one of the biggest um, downfalls is that so, some of the voice may be funded by these mining companies, BHP, Rio Tinto. Uh, these, these are the corporate... You know, these greedy corporates that are constantly blowing up our site. But, so but, there's but that But we haven't mistrust. heard anything c confirmed of this. This is the information that you've been hearing. Is this... The th what, that you say people are not getting the right information. Is that right? A lot, a lot of it is, yeah. Like, people are just so uncertain. They have questions. We need to, we need to answer these questions. Just quickly, Tim, to, well, to those concerns. That yeah, well, what, what Taylor's outlining is really sets the challenge for the rest of the, this constitutional referendum debate. That means going uh, into community and, and uh, government 
as well as the campaigns, uh, listening carefully to what communities have got to say, uh, mm. and 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 upfront dealing with these challenges, um, upfront making sure uh, that we're that we're answering these questions, and most importantly, listening in a respectful respectful way. Um, I I am I am very optimistic um, about how this referendum campaign is going to proceed. I'm encouraged by the way that Australians are dealing with it. And I just say to, to viewers, you know, the most important thing that you can do is make sure you get all of the information. If you haven't read the Uluru Statement from the heart, read it. Like, read it. Um, because it's, it's one of the most important, um, important documents in our reconciliation history. And all Australians should, should read it and just, engage just with the material. Can I, just, I just want to pick up on that point about information. It is important that all Australians are informed. It is important that we have a respectful debate. Uh, it's important that there should be a pamphlet going into every home with a yes case and a no case. Uh, there will be such a pamphlet. For some curious reason, the government's proposing not to have one. That's been the normal requirement in a referendum. I'm pleased they've now agreed to have mm. one because that is part of Australians being informed about the issues. I want to go to our next question now. We'll hear from Jeff Hughes. Good evening, Stan. Thanks for taking my... Uh question, which I was thought it would be to the panel, but I'm inspired by two people on this panel, Taylor and obviously Sophie. Very impressive. <laughs> so I have to read this. On the eve of Anzac Day, my question is, why did so many people die for Australia during the previous wars? Well, obviously to protect the home and your family. Stan, I'm here with my daughter, She's desperate to buy a place in Sydney and the property market, property market to this date is ridiculous. I don't think politics is going to fix the problem, nor governments. So I'm suggesting, because you might explain this to Sophie Stan, Australia exports minerals with hundreds of billions of dollars each year. A 5% levy will pay for a backlog of housing. I suggest a state of origin competition for each state making housing affordable. Let's face it, Australians love a contest. <laughs> I will go to Sophie as an outsider on this. Um, you may not be familiar with State of Origin, but not, if you're in New South Wales and, and Queensland, there's not too much more important in a year than a rugby league State of Origin match. But to that idea of making things fairer, mm -hmm. you face this in your own country. We see this around the world, a younger generation squeezed out yeah. of the housing market and increasing wealth gap. Mm -hmm. What impact is that having on us socially? Well, it has a huge impact. Um, this generation of young people are the first generation who are likely to fare worse than their parents. So, um, for many centuries, the life chances of our younger people have got better than their parents. But um, actually, in terms of measures like housing, um, like the economic impacts of climate change that our younger generations will be paying the price of, um, issues in terms of um, life expectancy actually starting to plateau um, in many areas. There are some really big concerns for our for our younger generations, um, and indeed those generations who are who are yet to be born. Um, and that's why having a government which has legal duties to think to the long term. And let me just spend a moment saying the five principles by which our government in Wales has to operate. Um, they must consider the long-term impact of the things that they um, do and long-term trends and scenarios. They must prevent problems from occurring or from getting worse. They must take a holistic and integrated approach. So this is recognising the connections between things. To your point on housing, housing isn't just about, um, you know, a physical roof over your head. Actually, the World Health Organisation tells us that our living conditions, the quality of our homes, do we live in areas of high air pollution, do we have access to nature, mm. that actually makes 29% of the difference as to whether we live live um, to a ripe old age or we die younger um, than and, we should. And, 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 just, and just on that, Taylor, um, as someone who's the, the youngest here on, on the panel this evening and listening um, to, to the story there from Jeff about his daughter's um, own desire to buy a house and the difficulties of buying a house, how do you feel about this as a young person? Is this something that is an aspiration that is achievable, do you think, for yourself? I consider myself uh, very lucky. I, I, I'm the first family, uh, person in my family to buy a home. Um, and I, you know, I, I look to my mates who are 
in private renting who are just struggling to keep their head above, above the water at the moment. And when, and with respect to the politicians on the panel, like, a lot of the time the people up here often forget to communicate with the people down here at the grassroots level, the working class. And I may not have the answers, but that's where the answers are. Mm. And you see people not only squeezed out, but people, of course, who are renting and can't find a place to live, mm. to live, can't put a roof over their head. Yeah, that's exactly right. And there, there are young people where they, they've been kicked out of their house because their landlord has said, um, we're selling the house over the next couple of months. And then only to go back a month later and have a look at that line and it's, uh, have a look online at that house and it's vacated because they've upped the price in rents. They just wanted new tenants. Mm. Or, you know, when I've previously worked in the social justice department, I've had gentlemen that, that are about 70 years old sleeping on a park bench because they don't, mm. they don't know, they can't navigate the system for one and there's nowhere to go. Mm. This is our society. Mm -hmm. Nina, is it? Nina, good luck. Good luck getting a house. Um, <laughs> and thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for the question. Mm. I'll leave it with the politicians to take that idea away about a state <laughs> of origin contest <laughs> to see you come up with the best housing policy. We'll see, yeah, we'll we see where that leads of us. Origin. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah. Now, we can bring you the result of our online poll. Remember the question we asked you at the start of the program? Should the voting age in Australia be lowered from 18 to 16? Um, <laughs> whoa, yes. <laughs> tight. Tight. But 51% yes, 44% no, and unsure 5%. We're going to finish tonight's discussion with a question from Stuart Long. Thank you, Stan. Well, this is a question for Sophie Howe. Sophie, how do you propose to legally bind current political leaders to see beyond the short-term electoral cycle mm -hmm. and ask for future generations? Okay. What have your impressions been in what you've seen to date in Australia regarding our current political leaders and how they ask for our future generations? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Well, um, first of all, thank you um, to, and I've, I've spent, I've had a packed schedule meeting so many different organisations, young people, politicians, thank you to the Centre for Policy Development and Griffiths University for hosting my visit and thank you for the warm welcome from everyone that um, I've met. So I can say you're as friendly a bunch as us Welsh, that's the starting point. <laughs> um, and you often beat us at rugby. That's not so good. Um, <laughs> in you, terms you seem of... better, maybe, at rugby. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of um, my perspective, so, I mean, your electoral cycle at a Commonwealth level, um, you know, three years, by the time you've sort of got in, established yourself and, you know, um, done a small amount of things, you're campaigning for the next election. And that is actually, you know, in, in, in the, the UK, our term is, is five years. Even that's not long enough um, because um, you want... Every, you know, all politicians are trying to deliver things before the next election. Three years in your case, five years in our case. And things like how do we deal with a, a, an ageing population? Brilliant that we're all living longer, but it takes some long-term planning. Things like um, actually to take advantage of what we need to do on climate change, um, that has the potential to create hundreds of thousands of new jobs, but only actually, we're only going to take advantage of that if we have a long-term approach to investing in a skills pipeline to enable young Australians to develop the skills to, to do that. And so a short-term electoral cycle doesn't do that, which is why I am such a strong advocate of saying that our politicians, our governments and all of our public institutions must be legally bound beyond electoral cycles mm. to act in the long term and act in the interests of future generations. We're almost out of time. <laughs> and I'm watching the clock, but I do want to give 30 seconds to the rest on the panel, one thing each, James, that you would like to see left for your children for the future. The poll that scared me the last in the last five years is that 40% of young Australians don't believe democracy will deliver for them. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that my kids and the next generation have faith in our political institutions and have a sense of national cohesion. I think that's really important. Paul. Um, I want uh, young Australians to continue to enjoy uh, the prosperity and the good fortune of this nation and uh, also to protect our distinctive environment and natural heritage. Tim? Yeah, I want to see a, I want to see a, sta a safe climate. Uh, I want to see good jobs uh, and I want to see a society that's fairer uh, and stronger and more resilient. Taylor, you'll enjoy a lot more of the future than, you know, the blokes, <laughs> the blokes on the panel will tonight. So what does it look like for you? Oh, gosh. If I could say anything to the young people, stay 
stay staunch. Your voices will be heard soon. There's too many of us. There's too many young people. <laughs> They'll hear us soon. <laughs> and, and a lot smarter too. Thank you, Taylor. <laughs> That's all we have time for. Thanks again to our panel. Taylor Gray, Tim Ayres, Paul Fletcher, Sophie Howe and James Brown. Now, the Liberal Party's nominee for the vacant New South Wales Senate seat will <laughs> confirm tonight. You can't talk about that anymore. Um, thank you again for sharing your stories and questions. Next week, I'll be with you live from Melbourne. We'll be talking about health, literature and culture, among other issues. A great panel. Health and Aged Care Minister Mark Butler, Liberal Member for Bass, Bridget Archer, Researcher and Aboriginal Affairs commentator Anthony Dillon, American literature and culture expert Sarah Churchwell and GP and former AMA president Mukesh Haikawa. Head to our website, you can register there to be in the audience. Until then, have a good night.